Let us begin with prayer. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we give thanks unto thee for the joy of salvation and for the blessed assurance that in Jesus Christ we are more than conquerors. We thank thee, our Father, that in the face of all things we can stand firm on the assurance of victory. And so, our Father, encourage and strengthen our hearts. Make us bold as we confront the world and the flesh and the devil, that in all these things we may know that because thou art near, and that thou wilt never leave us nor forsake us. We can stand in boldness and in confidence, knowing that thou, Lord, art our shield and our exceeding great reward. Our God, we thank thee. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture is Psalm 8. Our subject today is Man and the Creed. With this, we conclude our series of studies in the creeds and councils of the early church. Psalm 8, Man and the Creed. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemy, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name, in all the earth. We have been studying for several months now the creeds and councils of the early church. And in a sense, our subject today is a very inappropriate one. Man and the creed. But the creeds do not talk about man. The Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Athanasian Creed, they make no mention of man. They speak of the triune God, of the doctrine of salvation, of eternal life, of the resurrection of the body, of the forgiveness of sin, but not of man. Why then is it necessary to have at the conclusion of our studies a kind of footnote or appendix dealing with man and the priest? for a very good reason. Because in recent years, all the books on the Apostles' Creed, for example, as they have been written by most of our churchmen today, insist that the creeds are talking not about God, but about man. that they affirm not our faith in God, but our faith in ourselves. What they do is to take the plain language of the creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And with their existentialist contortions, they make this add up to an affirmation of faith in man. One writer, for example, concludes a chapter, or concludes his book, rather, on the Apostles' Creed with a chapter on man in the creed. And he declares in this chapter that what the Apostles' Creed is talking about is the universal fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of all men and the divinity of all men. 
Now, this may seem strange to us who have been repeating the creed from childhood to find that these modernist doctrines are somehow in there. Moreover, he says, as against a belief in the triune God and the doctrine of sovereign grace and predestination, the creed, the Apostles' Creed, he declares, and I quote, asserts, man is essentially his own savior, himself divine, and therefore a kind of incarnation, unquote. This, we are told, is what the Apostles' Creed is talking about. This involves, of course, a fantastic misinterpretation and a deliberate one of the plain language of the creed. But it is so that they read all of Scripture as well as the creed. And they tell us, these people, because their perspective is existentialist, that we have a choice between obedience to authority and responsibility to ourselves. Now, what does this kind of language mean? Responsibility to ourselves. This, of course, is an impossibility if man is not under authority, if man has no God above and over him. For a man to be responsible just to himself is tantamount to saying that man is his own God. And God is responsible to no one. Responsibility is the accountability of a subject to a superior. Children are responsible to their parents, to their teachers, to all their superiors and to God. Wives are responsible to their husbands, to all duly constituted authority in church and state and to God. Men are responsible to all superiors at work and in any organization in church and state and responsible to God. Responsibility means that we are under authority. And to speak of man being responsible only to himself is to deny the idea of responsibility. And this, of course, is exactly what they have done. Their purpose is to gain for man unlimited liberty, which means man is his own God. And of course, every attempt to put man in the creed on the part of these men is an attempt to put God out of the creed. When they declare, as this particular book I cited on the Apostles' Creed, that Man is essentially his own savior, himself divine, and therefore a kind of incarnation. They are writing God out of the creed. It is not surprising, therefore, that a few of the more honest churchmen today, like Thomas J.J. J. Altizer, who heads the Death of God movement, have said so openly. Altizer declared at one university recently, and I quote, the Christian can rejoice in the death of God because he is free from any kind of ultimate norm and therefore he is released to live fully in the present. He is liberated, unquote. This is the goal to free man from any kind of ultimate norm, from any ultimate law, from any ultimate standard, to make man his own God, choosing for himself what constitutes right and wrong, 
The motive force of such thinking, I think, can be readily described. It is, first of all, the old satanic temptation. Satan tempted man, Genesis 3, 5 tells us, saying, Ye shall not surely die. Ye shall be as God, every man his own God, knowing, and the Hebrew word knowing has the force of determining, knowing, determining, or deciding for yourself what is good and evil. Every man his own God, every man his own moral arbiter. It is the denial of ultimate norms for self-created ones. Second, in such thinking, man identifies liberty and liberation as freedom from any kind of ultimate norm or law. Freedom is to be free from God. And this is exactly what the pulpit today is telling us on all sides. Man's true salvation is not in and through Jesus Christ. It is in freedom from God. And so the whole goal of our present day preaching is to save man, supposedly, by liberating him from God. Hence it is that they talk about the death of God and declare that we should rejoice in it. Third, man is supposedly to be freed from God to create his own norms and to be his own ultimate law. Every man his own God and his own law. Such thinking takes two forms. One is anarchism. Every man his own law. And you have a totally anarchic world in which there is no law and some have openly espoused this, no law against narcotics, no law against theft, no law against murder, no law against anything, because how can you legislate against God? And every man is his own God. There is a vast amount of literature along these lines. The other alternative, when man is his own law and his own God, is total sadism in which the collective divinity of all men is incorporated in the state. And the state becomes the super-god. And the state becomes the absolute law. This, of course, is Marxism. It is Fabian Socialism. It is John Dewey's Progressivism. It is Graham Wallace's Great Society. It is what we see all around us. When they talk about putting man into the creed, they are talking about abolishing God from the creed. And the result is not the death of God, but the death of man. Because when man is delivered from God into his own hands, it is the end of man. Man then has no appeal against injustice. How can man appeal against himself? How can man escape from himself? When man is his own oppressor, when man is his own burden, how can man escape from himself? There is then no source of help. <coughs> And if the state is the God and the ultimate law, then there is no appeal against the state, and you have absolute tyranny. Moreover, when man places himself in the creed and makes himself his own God, man makes himself, therefore, infallible and perfect. A God is infallible and perfect. And then you deny progress. If Washington can make no mistakes, or the UN can make no mistakes, then how can we have progress? The world can never change. It can never move ahead. 
because it has no concept of anything higher. The only way progress can be reintroduced into such humanistic thinking is to say that man is evolving to a higher stage and this is the only way they have reintroduced the possibility of progress. They declare, as Henry still has in Will the Human Race Survive, that man is simply a stage in evolution and we are going to develop into macro life. And macro life means that the whole world will be one state and probably there will be a one interplanetary state, ultimately, which will be one life form and what we call individuals today will then be no more than single cells in the macro life. Today we do not consider the rights of the cells in our body, of the cells, for example, in our nails or in our hair or in our skin. And we will have no more significance in this so-called glorious future in macro life because we will be, we are told, only cells. And the macro life can do with the cells as it sees fit. This is what the new creed amounts to. It takes the Apostles' Creed and reinterprets the language to give man unlimited liberty to make man his own God and his own Savior. But the Bible declares that man is created a creature and therefore he has limited liberty and limited power and man cannot be his own Savior. Man cannot even determine the most simple things about his life. Who can determine the day of his birth? And who can determine how tall he shall be? Or what his aptitude can be? Man is not free to be a god, but he is free to be the man God made him to be. For man to seek an escape from God is to seek the impossible. As David said in Psalm 139, Whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, behold, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, thou art there. Man cannot escape from God. But this is what the sinner seeks. As Dr. Cornelius Van Til has said, if there were one button in the universe which if man could press could give him an experience isolated from God, an experience which would not involve God, which would involve him in total independence from God, man the sinner would eternally press that single button. But there is no such button. At every point, in every experience, man is face to face with God. Even in the innermost recesses of his own being, he is face to face with God because God made him. And the stamp of God and the testimony of God is on, on every single cell of his body, on every grain of dust, on every atom in the universe. David in Psalm 8, as he marveled at the handiwork of God, declared, What is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion, over the works of thy hand, thou hast put all things under his feet. The glory of this indeed is amazing. 
Man was created by God in his own image. Created to have dominion over the earth. Man by sin fell. Lost dominion over the earth and over himself. But in Jesus Christ he is recreated to have dominion. To have all things put under his feet. To be priest prophet and king over the earth in Christ. This is man's destiny. But how and where is man to be found in the creed? These people tell us man is in the creed. And our answer is yes, but not in the sense in which you declare Man is in the creed, but not as the object of the creed, because the creed is not about him, nor is he the subject of the creed, for the faith is the subject of the creed. Man is in the creed only as the believer. He appears in a single word, the first person pronoun, I believe. In God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, I believe this is man's cause. This is man's place in the creed as the confessor. Man's salvation is not to make of himself his own God, but to submit to every word of God. For man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. Man's salvation is to believe in Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, to declare the biblical faith, to confess the triune God, to say, I believe and to become the confessor of God's glory and truth, and to become the recipient of God's grace and prosperity. For the chief end of man, as the Catechism long ago declared, is to enjoy God and to glorify Him forever. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee that Thou hast called us by faith to be Thy people, to confess Thy name, to rejoice in the majesty of Thy word, to stand in Thy promises, which are yea and amen through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our Lord and our God, we thank Thee for so glorious a destiny. We thank thee that thou hast made us lords over creation in Jesus Christ, that thou hast put all things under our feet. Make us therefore bold in faith and confident unto victory. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Are there any questions now? Yes. I was wondering if we could discuss faith just a little bit. I uh, was listening to somebody this uh, week talking about the word faith. We went from the faith in Jesus Christ right into the faith that our scientists have in the laboratory. And it was about making a decision. And I was thinking to myself, can we have absolute faith in part 12? Truth. Yes, a very good point. Yes, the word faith has a variety of meanings, and we must, as you uh, so well pointed out in your question, understand its ramifications. 
there is, first of all, the very purely going into some of the high points of what faith involves. There is first the purely human faith, which means basically self-confidence. You face the world with self-confidence. You have faith that you can do this or that. And this is an important factor in the life and experience of a man. They have found with uh, tests run under hypnotism, for example, that a man whose normal gripping power will test out to so many pounds, or a woman for that matter, they've tried it on both, will, if under hypnosis, be told that he is a sick and dying man, have almost no grip. But if they tell him or her that they are Samson, the strongest man in the world, their grip will test out to a phenomenal degree. Now, faith in this sense is purely a human thing. It is self-confident. And this is not what the Bible is talking about. So when they are talking about faith in science and in what is going to be done in the future, they are talking about this purely human faith confidence in your ability either as an individual or confidence in the ability collectively of men. This has nothing to do with what the Bible is talking about. When the Bible talks about faith, it is talking about something that is supernatural. It is the gift of God. And in Hebrews we are told uh, in Hebrews 11 some very important things about faith. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So that, first of all, faith is the substance or ground or confidence and there have been some commentators in the past who said that there is the connotation of title deeds there. When someone gives you a title to something, it means you have title in that property, although you have never seen it. And I know some people who have titles as some very fine property that they've never seen, which they have inherited or which they have never been able to see since they negotiated for it but they have a title deed to it. They own it, even though they have not seen it. So faith is the substance. It's the title deed. It's the reality of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, evidence, again, is a legal term. And evidence says that here is proof. Now, the humanistic faith is self-confident. It may or may not be valid. But the Bible is talking about something that is a supernatural thing, which is a matter of evidence. God says it is. It is substance. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word, word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear, so that <clears throat> faith witnesses to us that God is creator of heaven and earth, and that all things were made by him, so that faith is a form of knowledge. It is the key to knowledge. Then in the sixth verse, we are told further, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So that faith also brings us to God with the evidence that he is, with the evidence that he will reward us so that we make our stand not in terms of being rewarded by men but by our Father which is in heaven with an absolute confidence. Thus faith is the gift of God. It is a supernatural thing 
given by God. It is not a human affirmation or a human self-confidence. It is the grace of God in our hearts which makes us respond to him. And the Bible speaks of it as the difference between life and death. And St. It is a supernatural thing given by God. It is not a human affirmation or a human self-confidence. It is the grace of God in our hearts which makes us respond to him. And the Bible speaks of it as the difference between life and death. And St. Paul says, Ye which were sometimes dead in your sins and trespasses are now alive in Jesus Christ. What is the difference? Faith. Jesus Christ has saved them. They have been regenerated and have faith. They are alive. So this is the meaning of faith from the biblical perspective. Does that help clarify it? Yes. Yes. We know it. And, and we are the proof of it as well as God's word because we are alive in him. We ourselves are evidence of the grace of God. They have a faith, but it is not a supernatural faith. Their faith is in dialectical materialism, that everything is going to work out in terms of this determined plan, you see, a materialistically determined plan. So they have the blueprint. They're moving in terms of faith, but it's a faith without substance. Yes. They are then existentialists believing in themselves, you see. Right. Existentialism is the reigning uh, philosophy of the day. And you deny that there is anything in the world except yourself. Yes. Uh, no, uh, it goes back basically as far as to Satan's temptation. The Tower of Babel was the affirmation of the same thing. Then this kind of faith became formalized first in uh, some of the ancient peoples, uh, the Phrygians, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Greeks in particular, and from them it infected the Phariseeism, which was a product of such thinking. And the basic motif is still to this day pre-Christian pagan. It has captured uh, Judaism, and it's captured the churches as well. And the original pagan motifs are still very obvious, and the symbols also. Uh, but more specifically, uh, I had in mind that some of the leaders of these cults, not the Pharisees, but others, use this. First, they, they give it to their followers that all of these followers, of course, uh, are of this diet. However, in the event of learning, may some others, and the kids seem more equal than most, uh, they think of that. Mm -hmm. Yes, but that was a very, very old belief before they uh, ever encountered it. It was a very old belief. And you have it in a highly refined form in some of the uh, earlier societies.
It's hard to say it would depend on the person. Well, but a lot of things is, well, one thing is to give you an example, in, in different uh, school disciplines for children, uh, um, a lot of hard work that might be presented to them. Um, there's a shrugging of the shoulders, and I'm thinking it has no value. Uh, you and I might see it as, as we must say, it would be a discipline. But uh, because there's not something tangible that they can see as an end result for that effort, I wonder if this is actually central thinking. No, not necessarily, because uh, we don't always understand the meaning of what we are experiencing and the purpose of it. This does not mean we are existentialists. It means that uh, we haven't yet ascertained what God's purpose is in this. We've all undergone some trying experience or other, or a great many in our lives. Never understood at the time the meaning of it. But it has been a part of God's preparation of us for uh, our work, or for faith, or for particular responsibilities, or perhaps for our responsibility and initiation at the end of the world. Well, you brought out another thought there. We don't have to understand and know all this. All right? And you yeah. shouldn't always be analyzing everything or deciding what's trying to decide what God's purpose is or is not in this city. We should know he has a purpose, and we're going to find out sooner or later. So, uh, very often, there's no point in trying to. Well, we can, we should seek to, but we need to take all things from the hand of God. Well, it's it goes, that assurance. It goes it's, back again to faith. Yeah. It all things well. Yeah. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28. Yeah. No. I do not. We shall be uh, going into Daniel, this is a good time to mention it, next Sunday. We'll begin a series of studies chapter by chapter in the book of Daniel and then Revelation. And in these studies, uh, I hope your questions will not be geared against other opinions because I'm not uh, going to teach them in order to fight with anybody else who's interpreting Daniel, but just to understand it as I believe uh, Scripture uh, should be understood. And so I hope in the succeeding weeks, in the first two, three weeks, there isn't much that's controversial, but there are controversies over the interpretation of certain passages. And I want our purpose to be to understand rather than to fight. Yes. Yeah. The answer to that, I think, is this. Japan has better capacity for making the atomic bomb than most countries in the world. Far better than, for example, France and Britain. Its industrial potential is very great. Now, if they want to have the bomb as a deterrent, they can make it themselves this year. They can do it. If they aren't interested in uh, any such thing as a deterrent, say, to communism in the Far East, will our gift of uh, one or more bombs constitute any uh, effective gift? 
In other words, either Japan is going to see that it has to make a stand or it isn't going to make a stand. And you cannot put a responsibility and a position on people that they aren't assuming for themselves. We have given a great deal in the way of armament to a great many countries in the world, and all we have for us is the bill. No results. Second, I don't believe that it has uh, anything to do with prophecy. Yes. No, uh, not in this series. Perhaps at a later time, if you're interested, I'll take up the various Reformation creeds. Uh, there are several outstanding uh, creeds. The Lutheran uh, Church had several excellent ones. There are the various Calvinistic and Presbyterian creeds, including the Westminster, the Scottish creeds uh, are especially fine, and of course the 39 Articles of the Church of England. And if you're interested, uh, sometime in the future after we go through this series, we could go into the Reformation creeds. It would be a long series again because there's a great deal of uh, material there in the creeds, the very specific and detailed. And of course, we are getting some creeds right now that are totally body and like the Creed of 67, which the Presbyterian Church is adopting right now. It is a body and creed which puts man in the center, which effectively dissolves uh, the biblical faith uh, in favor of existentialism and social action, so that it will be really a social action agency, a revolutionary movement, rather than a Christian church. And this is true of virtually all the churches. This is true of Koku, uh, this new uh, group which is to unite the ten major denominations into a super church as the first step towards the world church. Everything in line for Koku, uh, it would be easy to mispronounce that and come closer to the truth. Uh, hints of uh, really a revolutionary social agency. Its purpose is the destruction of the church. We see at the same time, by the way, and perhaps some of you have seen uh, a tabloid paper that uh, McIntyre recently put out a special issue on the Internal Revenue Service. The Internal Revenue Service is tracking down 
on many churches now because they are not affiliated with the National Council. It refuses them the name of the church and tax exemption if they are disaffiliated or have never affiliated. Well, this applies to the Protestant churches primarily because, of course, these other groups are basically united already with them. The Buddhists, uh, the Jewish, the Catholic groups are all united together in the United Nations organization in UNESCO. They're all members together. So that there has been union affected of a sort already. And uh, now there will be progressive union down below. There are only a handful of small groups that are not involved in this. Well, when you realize the infallibility of the law of reaction, there must be a counter movement against all this sort of bloodless on blood so doing it. Well, the counter movement. Yes. The counter movement. Uh, is being taken care of progressively through things like this. And uh, one such measure, of course, is precisely the internal revenue check. It is also a fact today that any uh, wealthy men who are taking steps to implement resistance are uh, finding uh, the government uh, working on them night and day so that they will be too tied up legally to do anything, and some of the developments, uh, which I'm not free to talk about publicly, that have taken place there just in the last few days are staggering. So there is a move to destroy any possible reaction by killing it uh, at the point of origin. Yes. There doesn't seem to be any. The internal revenue is virtually a law unto itself. What yeah. specific steps are taking in the against the duties that they have done in this area uh, affecting tax exemption? Is it, is it threatened or is it... No, no. They have actually taken the tax exemption away from a number of churches. On what ground? But the church is not a member of the National Council. It isn't the subsidies and another reason given, that is the reason given? That reason has actually been given, and this tabloid, McIntyre, has a photocopy of one person's tax return, uh, where they have given quite a few thousand to a particular church, and uh, the notation from Internal Revenue was disallowed. The church is not affiliated with the National Council. Uh, uh, yes, if you write to uh, Dr. McIntyre and ask for his uh, tabloid, his special tabloid on uh, the Internal Revenue Service in the churches, and send some money, he'll send you a number of copies, I'm sure. Huh? Yes, they've taken lifelines of such an exemption away, and I believe Billy Hargis is either taken away or is in process of being taken away. The reason given in his case was that uh, one issue of his Christian crusade spoke uh, critically of the Supreme Court decision on prayer and advocated support of the Christian amendment. This made them a lobbyist. Of course, the National Council is uh, indulging in full-time lobbying without any trouble. It just depends on what you're lobbying for. The National Rifle Association, incidentally, is also in process of uh, being examined. The Sierra Club has had its uh, exemption taken away. Yes. One important point here, uh, some folks don't realize, is that That's not entirely so, 
Now, and this is the, uh, the, the origin of tax exemption is this. And this is the reason why the early church was persecuted in the Roman Empire. The thesis of the Roman Empire and of every pagan state in antiquity was this. That the state was God and Savior, absolute God over man. That every religion that existed had to be licensed. And it could not exist until it applied for permission. And then it became, uh, in effect, a, de- uh, a branch of the Department of Public Works of the state. Now, the church refused to apply to Rome for legality. The witness of the church was that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. The emperor is not the one who gives us permission to worship. So that we cannot go to the state and ask for the right of worship. This is required of us by God. Now, at any time, had the church gone to the Roman Empire and said, we want to be licensed as a regular religion in the empire, then it would have been granted. They would have acknowledged the uh, overall sovereignty of the emperor. They would have offered incense to his image. Then they could have gone off and had what they would have called, wrongly, a Christian church. Thus, the thesis of the church was simply this. We are the kingdom of Jesus Christ. We are independent of the state. The state has no jurisdiction over us. And they maintained what the Old Testament maintained, that the sanctuary was privileged ground, that the officers of the state could not come in through the doors of the church to make any arrest or to seize any person because this was God's territory. And therefore it had, as it were, diplomatic immunity from the state. Now, they fought and they won. And it was basic to our Western liberty because, of course, it led to the concept which is basic to the Bible. The state is the ministry of justice. It has no jurisdiction in in any other realm. It does not have jurisdiction over the family. It has no jurisdiction over education. It has no jurisdiction over business. It's not the overall institution, but it's one institution among many. If you say the state or any institution has right over others, then tomorrow another institution might say, oh, but we have that right, and the church did for a while. And he said, we have the right to guide and direct and lay down the law for every institution. For a while, in the later Middle Ages, the university claimed that right, and it's doing it again. But it is the one that lays down the law to everyone else and has the right to reorganize the world in terms of its own uh, ideas. But, according to God's laws, it's carefully worked out in the Mosaic Law. There is a ministry of justice, that is the state. And its concern is justice, just that. There is the ministry of grace, which is the church. There is the family, that's an independent institution. It's not under the church, and it's not under the state. It is directly under God as church and state are. The school or education is directly under God, and it should not be under anyone else. And business. Each businessman is under God. He's not under the state and he's not under the church. Now, this is uh, uh, this kind of thinking is what made possible our liberty. Our country was established on this kind of idea. And the uh, Puritans in the early days spoke of these as covenant spheres. The family, the church, the school, uh, business, uh, private associations, all these in the state were different covenant spheres where a man entered into a covenant with God. And God promised him, if he obeyed him, that he would bless him in that sphere. If he disobeyed him, he would be under the curse of God. Now, This is what we have to get back to. 
And we've had centuries of trouble in our Western history because either the state or the church has claimed to be the overall institution. And this business of uh, tax exemption, of course, is precisely this. Originally, the Constitution gave the federal government income only from excise and import taxes, so that only duties on goods that uh, went out of the country or came in, uh, this was the only way the government could raise funds for the tax. We've gone a long way from there. And the purpose was deliberately to keep the federal government in its place, so that the family could be independent the school could be independent, and the church, and business, and every other sphere. Now, tax exemption originally applied, you see, precisely to those Christian institutions whose purpose was to do the work of God in a particular sphere. And only since, well, Carnegie in particular, have foundations been deflected to another purpose. But the purpose of foundations and tax exemption for foundations, like that of tax exemption for the churches, was that this is an area that belonged to God, a man under God, and the state had no jurisdiction. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mean the. Uh, Yes. How? Yes. So does uh, the most the uh, Protestant church, the Mormon church, is one of the biggest uh, property groups in the United States. The Church of England, uh, well over 50% of its income comes from uh, business sources that it owns. However, these are not the churches that are having trouble. They are working hand in and glove with the state so that uh, these who are abusing this tax exemption are precisely the ones that are working with the state to destroy those who are Christians. So this move is not against people who are in business or churches that are in business. It's against churches that are in Christian work. Yeah. What? Runaway inflation could wipe out these foundations very well, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. A lot of foundations today are being set up with tax charges. I didn't know of a $125 million organization that was set up, and uh, the only son of the fellow uh, left of money was. Uh, Named in the well of the in the foundation of the administrator with absolute cut money mm -hmm. as long as he lived. Well, he was better off than though he inherited the money because there was no inheritance. That's true, but those who are being given these privileges are not those on our side. So it is becoming a dog and a very ugly one. But you see, legitimate organizations are denied. What is their God-given right? And this is like the one you mentioned, and Playboy are being constituted as foundation under a law that was set up uh, for Christian purposes. Well, our time uh, is ended, so we stand at